Good, e <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Bible Baptist Church on Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Anyone that's joining us online, we're glad you're with us. I'd like you to stand, and we are going to open our service in prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for the opportunity we have to gather together, uh, to assemble together as your design. We thank you for the gathering of the saints in this place. We thank you, Father, for all the gatherings that are going on across this country to those who still honor you and still honor the Lord's day. We pray, Father, that you'd bless your word tonight. Pray, Father, that uh, as we study your, your word, that we would hear it, listen with, with eager hearts, that we would respond with whatever it is that you would have for us regarding the text that we use tonight. Lord, may we be obedient to you. May we worship you tonight. Father, we're so grateful that you are a holy God, the Lord God omnipotent. And as you sit on your throne, what is taking place in this small room today, Father, and all across the country is intended to be worship of your majesty. And Lord, I pray tonight that you would receive from us the glory, the honor, the worship, the praise that is due to your name. And we ask your blessing tonight in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please remain standing. All right, let's open our hymnals to hymn number 49. Blessed be the name, hymn 49. Blessed be the name. 
Blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. His name above all names shall stand, exalted more and more. At God the Father's own right hand, where angel hosts adore. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Redeemer, Savior, friend of man, once ruined by the fall, thou hast devised salvation's plan, for thou hast died for all. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His name shall be the Counselor, the mighty Prince of Peace. Of all earth's kingdoms conqueror, whose reign shall never cease. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. The um, John Caputo will be preaching on June 13th. June 13th, right? Yes. He'll be Sunday here preaching morning. Sunday morning on June 13th, <clears throat> and that's a real opportunity. He's a, if you ever, you ever have him, he's a great preacher, a uh, great man of God, and I would encourage you to come on the 13th. Also, on, in July, we will have the Sharing Your Faith Seminar. I think that's going to be a Saturday in July. Um, and there are free books on the back from Marcy Zito, so if you're interested um, I think a lot of them have gone, but there's still a bunch back there. There's back there. And then also, even though it's in the evening and it's been all day, hopefully everybody's had a good Mother's Day, all the mothers. And we just want to bless and thank you. And that's, this morning's sermon was phenomenal. Um, that was good. Um, but we want to just be thankful for mothers. And, and, you know, it's neat because when you think of um, the sacrifice that a woman, woman makes for her children, and, you know, having the child, raising the child and all. It's a good example of how Christ gave himself for us. And a woman gives herself for her children. Obviously, it's not, Christ is much greater, and I'm not trying to downplay him at all. But it is an honor to be a mom. So, thank you very much, all you moms. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that we can be here to worship you and to glorify you. And we just lift up our offerings now as we bring forth our offerings that they would just be part of our worship and they are showing that we are putting our trust in you instead of ourselves. Help us, Lord, to worship you in our offering. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Amen. Thank you, Garrett. I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 John chapter 1 for our scripture reading. 1 John chapter 1. And let's all stand for the reading of God's Word. And once again, I'm just going to read the entire chapter since there's only ten verses. Please follow along as I read. The Bible says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the Word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of Him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have have fellowship with Him, and walk in darkness, we lie, and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. May God bless His word. I want to encourage you to be praying for Amelia tomorrow. She uh, meets with the doctor and we are praying that... uh, you will hear the results of the biopsy, and, and we're praying that we will hear great news and that she will hear great news and be encouraged. Then on Tuesday, Ed has a follow-up appointment. I think this is his first one since his surgery, and uh, so you want to keep Ed Carpenter in prayer as well, uh, along with Sandy Hodge. Her husband's funeral was on Tuesday, so this is very fresh to her. Let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your watch care over us. And once again, Lord, we thank you for moms. We thank you for our mothers. And uh, Lord, we're so grateful for their example. We're so grateful for um, the love that they have for their children. We're especially also thankful for all the moms in our church who have been an example to all the rest of us and young people that have grown up and seen uh, godly womanhood lived out. And we praise you for that. We pray, Father that the young people that have grown up in this church would never forget the example of their mother and other mothers. We pray, Father, that it would indeed impact them in the same way that John Newton's mother's example ended up bringing him back to the faith. Father, we pray for Amelia. as She uh, goes to the doctors tomorrow. We pray that you give her comfort and healing from the pain and the, the restlessness that the good days, we pray that she'll have more good days and bad days. And then tomorrow we pray that when she meets with the doctor, that it would be a blessed experience, that you would be glorified, that we would be praising you. And we will praise you, Father, uh, for whatever. We praise you because you are good all the time. And I know that she feels that way. We just ask your blessing in her life. And then for Ed Carpenter, as he gets his follow-up, Father, pray that um, that all would be good and his numbers would be what they should be. And We just commit him to you. And uh, Father, I pray for Sandy Hodge that you would comfort her. Thank you for all the family that is gathered around her for blessing her with uh, many children and grandchildren and and relatives that just surrounded her and engulfed her uh, this past week. And we pray that that when all the people go away and she is left alone and, and hurting, we just pray that you would minister to her in a very special way. Please bless your word tonight. Help us, Father, to be better because we've met together and and been under the preaching of your word. We've come to know more about you. And Father, I pray that we would love your word more and more every day and that we would be light 
to a dark world. And we ask your blessing in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. We'll open up to him 51, Blessed Assurance, him 5 1. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. All right, please take your Bibles and turn back to 1 John chapter 1. We are going through 1 John in our evening service. Those of you that are online, if any of you are out there watching us, we welcome you to come back. I am praying that God's people will come back. It is safe. I believe that. As your pastor, I can encourage you. Uh, God will protect us. Uh, I have been greatly concerned with the fear that has been pushed on this world and it has affected so much and um, now I'm beginning to wonder okay now how much how much is the lack of people coming back fear because of the coronavirus or just that we've got quite comfortable with having church whenever we want it online and and um I've noticed that our, our uh, online streaming watch, viewing audience has dropped dramatically. I know some of us, some have come back, and maybe perhaps some are watching it during the week, but uh, I am concerned about the health of the church in America, and, uh, and of course our church in particular. We are going through First John. I'm so thankful for everyone that's here tonight. We are expounding the Word of God, going verse by verse. Last Sunday we had communion, so... We just spent a shorter time in this text. My goal was very ambitious. It was verses 5, 6, and 7. And um, didn't get to verse 7. Barely got to verse 6. Um, did get verse 5. You know, we looked at verse 5. So tonight, um, I'm going to go back to verse 6. Uh, and then just park here tonight. And then next week, Lord willing, we'll go to verse 7. Uh, the theme of, of John, 1 John, is var varied fellowship is 
one of the main things. Fellowship with God, fellowship with one another. Uh, it is written to give us assurance if we are saved and to challenge us uh, if, we are, if we are not saved. And we've looked last week and tonight we're looking at the contrast between darkness and light. That's the imagery that John uses as he talks about Jesus Christ being the light. So let's look at verses 5, 6, and 7, and then we'll just spend time on verse 6. Look at 1 John chapter 1 again, verse 5. John says, This then is the message that we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light. And then Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, also declared that he was the light. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. There's no gray areas. God is clearly light. There's no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. That's our text tonight. Next week we'll look at verse 7. So again, verse 6. 1 John 1, 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So many scriptures talk about the fact that God is light. In fact, look at verse 8 of 1 John chapter 2. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. Clearly a reference, going back to this text, to Jesus Christ being the light. And His very presence has dispelled the darkness. Some commentators think that that this is also a reference to the law, which was a shadow of good things to come. Uh, and, And clearly, that might have application, but clearly Jesus Christ is the light that we're talking about. But I want you to think a minute about all the contrast in the scriptures between light and darkness and you and I that are saved are challenged to walk in the light Ephesians I'm going to give you a couple verses listen to this one you don't need to turn here because I'm going to have you turn to another place Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8 Paul used this same imagery and he said for ye were sometimes darkness but now are ye light in the Lord. That is apropos. That is true for every born-again child of God. No matter how old you were when you got saved. Uh, we were darkness before God illuminated our eyes with the glorious light of the gospel. We were darkness. And depending on how long you and I walked in darkness will determine uh, how dark it was. And I want to is that we picture this again, Ephesians 5 eight. you were sometime darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. If there's a parallel passage, and this goes along with 1 John chapter 1. And the parallel passage, I want you to turn there, is 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Because I want to spell that out. What does John mean when he says, if we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. What does that mean to walk in darkness? Does that mean you don't you turn the lights off wherever you go, and or you only maybe you're nocturnal, and you only wake up at night and go out at night? No, he's not talking about that. It is clearly an imagery of a moral lifestyle, and the person who claims that he's walking in the light but is consistently living in sin is lying and deceiving himself. And in fact, John is going to talk about that later on. Uh, This whole chapter, he talks about sin. In the last few verses, he'll address that even specifically. But I want you to look at 1 Corinthians 6. I want to spell out what John means when he says, if we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness. Remember, we, we sometime were darkness, walked in darkness. In other words, we once walked in darkness. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Everybody there? Know ye not, Paul says, that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So the unrighteous is a a parallel to those who walk in darkness. And he is explaining, uh, in fact, he's really using the law 
Uh, and that, that's how God works. The law is a schoolmaster to bring us to faith. It is through God's perfect holy standards, the Ten Commandments and their intent, that shows us that we are sinners. The law never justifies anyone. It only condemns. And that's its purpose. So the question is, has it condemned you? Oh, I don't like all this judgment talk. You know what? If we don't first get condemned of our sins and realize that we are condemned sinners, the gospel is going to make no sense to us. We're not going to realize that we are sinners until we tremble at the law that we've been spurning. And so this is what Paul spells it out. By the way, there's various lists. John even uses the list. Peter uses the list. Paul uses lists. Jesus uses lists to help identify and get our mind wrapped around it. What does it mean to walk in darkness? It is living in unrighteousness. So look what Paul says. Again, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Sinners can't get to heaven. Now let's back up for a minute. We are presenting, and that's what I believe Paul's doing here, is he is laying out the groundwork for the fact that God is so holy that sin cannot be in His presence. Psalm chapter 5, verses 4 and 5 says that God is so holy that, that evil cannot dwell with Him. He's so pure, He's so holy. Habakkuk 1.13 says that thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil. And canst not, God cannot look on iniquity. So as much as God loves you, it is our sin that keeps us from being able to be in His presence. And so, if you have not faced the, the law of God, the commandments of God, what God expects is perfect standard. You need to do that. And I intend to do that tonight. I realize that everybody here professes Christ. And, and you've, all to my knowledge, you've all been saved. Uh, and, and, uh, but I want to lay it out in light of the text that we're at today, both by way of reminding you how important it is to... Allow God to use His perfect standards to convict people when you witness to them. You know, the idea that the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to faith. I believe, I'm convinced, that one of the failures of modern New Testament evangelism is the failure to preach sin. We talk about the love of God we preach that Jesus died for the sins of the world and that if you just believe on Jesus or pray this prayer, that you'll get to heaven. And so many people, and even in our church, especially in the early days, uh, where it really did not sink into my mind the purpose of the law. And this, this is what God did in my life as a young 17-year-old young man. God used the law and especially the intent of the law spelled out by Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 and 6. Uh, that, you know, you've heard it said, thou shalt not do this, but I'm telling you if you do this, and then you bring out a very se more severe standard. And it was then that I trembled at the law that I'd spurned. It was then that I realized that I was as guilty as guilty could be. This good religious altar boy. And by the way, I used to pride myself in that. I was an altar boy. You know, altar boys get to wear neat robes. Mine was red and white. I look so holy. I'm kind of kidding. But you know, there was definitely a pride, proud, pride there, being an altar boy. But when I came face to face with my own wicked heart, then I trembled. Then I realized, this good religious kid's on his way to hell and would deserve every moment of it. And it was only then, folks, that I was ready to get saved. And I believe Paul is approaching this this way uh, and we'll conclude at the end of this message with the last verse in this. But this, I believe, is the best explanation of 1 John 1, 6. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So what is walking in darkness? Paul spells it out. Verse 9. 
Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither. And now he goes into a list. We're just going to walk through it. Just as if we were walking through the Ten Commandments. This is God's standard, His righteous standard held up high for all of us to see. And I want you to just examine your own heart. Be not deceived. Fornicators. Let's go. It all goes, each one of these words, each one of these lifestyles goes back to the previous verse or the previous sentence shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, in other words, be not deceived. Neither fornicators uh, shall inherit the kingdom of God. In fact, at the end of verse 10, it puts that sentence, that statement in there again. So we're going to use that with each one, of these, each one of these lifestyles. Be not deceived. Fornicators shall not inherit the kingdom of God. What is a fornicator? The Greek word is the word pornos. It's where we get the word pornography. And it has to do with every kind of sexual immorality outside of the bounds of matrimony outside of the bounds of matrimony specifically uh, sexual immorality again pre-marriage and it includes simply um, promiscuousness uh, having relationships before marriage and the bible says fornicators shall not inherit the kingdom of god Charlie preached on Hebrews not too long ago. Or was it long ago, Charlie? And it was Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4, which said this. In fact, I heard an interesting theory after Charlie preached that. And Charlie and I are both of an inclination that, that it was written by Paul. Uh, I have heard that uh, one, one t philosophy that I heard was that Paul preached it and Luke wrote it. And, um, or someone else wrote it. And then recently I heard that Paul preached it in one language and then Luke actually wrote it down in a different language. But whatever it was, I'm convinced Paul wrote this. But look at, look at Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4. Hebrews 13 and verse 4 says this. Because it spells out, what is a fornicator? Marriage is honorable in all. And the bed undefiled. God honors marriage. Folks, God created the, the physical relationship between a man and a woman. And it is holy. There's a book called Holy Sex because it really is holy. But the world has corrupted it. But in the context of marriage, it is a beautiful thing. It is perfectly holy. But you take it outside of marriage and it becomes wicked and evil. And that's exactly what fornication is. Fornication is fulfilling the lusts of the flesh outside, the, the drives, the desires that God put there outside of the context of marriage. So you're not married. Two people who engage in physical intimacy outside of marriage, they're not married. It is sin. It is fornication. And just so you know, the Bible says, be not deceived. Fornicators shall not inherit the kingdom of God. We live in such a cavalier ad uh, society that it, and I mentioned it this morning, not only with motherhood, but with marriage. People are just not as interested in marriage anymore. Marriage is in crisis. Less and less people are getting married today because we're not honoring marriage. So what is fornication? Again, whoremonger, again, Hebrews 13, 4, marriage is honorable and all in the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Now those two categories describe the violation of the marriage bed. Marriage is honorable in all, the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers. Now we already know what adulterers is. That's the term Paul's going to use in a few minutes. That is physical relationship outside of marriage. So someone that's married who has pledged themselves to minister to and meet the physical needs of the opposite person, the person they married, man, woman, nothing else, that when they experience and have fulfilled that relationship with someone outside of that marriage, that is adultery. And by the way, adulterers shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But let's go back to fornicators. Do you know that sex outside of marriage, people that do that will not go to heaven. Now, I'm, I'm saying that 
And I hope, I hope it shocks you. Because there's so many professing religious people that, have, that either live, what we used to say living in sin, you know, they're living in the same house, and it's very clear they're, they're not platonic. They're, and, and some even have children, and they expect everyone to embrace that. There's no acknowledgement that, listen, what I did was wrong. I'm sorry, I want to get this right. There needs to be a whole lot of that, folks. People that, you know, people are going to churches and expecting, hey, I've, I have a child out of wedlock and I've never repented of this, and you just have to embrace me. And then they get mad at the church when the church doesn't condone it. We've had some hard situations come into our church. I remember one time, and I forget who it is, and I'm kind of glad that I do, it was years ago, where a young lady had physical relationships outside of marriage and, and became pregnant and started coming to our church. There was never any, no addressing of this. I did something wrong and I need to at least confess it. And then there was an expectation that we have a, a shower for that person. And I just did not feel comfortable. I was probably painted as the bad guy. But folks, it is so important that our sin is addressed fornicators shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If you have committed sin, if you've committed, if you have had relationships and even maybe had a child or not, and you've not repented of that sin, make it very clear, folks, fornicators shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Tremble at God's law. You've broken. God says marriage is honorable and all. And that whoremongers, by the way, that, that term whoremongers is a direct reference to those who have physical relationships and they're not married. Whoremongers. God will judge. By the way, that's an interesting thing. If you look at Hebrews 13.4, whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Why does, why does Paul say that? Or why does the writer of Hebrews say that? Uh, let me read to you two commentaries that, that lay this out. Christianity introduced, uh, this is regarding Hebrews 13.4, marriage is honorable and all, the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Christianity, Christianity introduced a whole new conception regarding the sin of fornication, which especially in the depraved decadence of heathenism under the Roman Empire was hardly regarded as any sin at all. Hence the necessity for constantly raising a warning voice against it. This verse is specifically saying, when it says, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge because they weren't being judged then. And by the way, in our society, it's not a crime. You know, you can commit adultery, you can have physical relationships, you can live with someone, and no problem. In fact, if people don't accept you or anyone would ever try to say that you're doing wrong, that's the bad guy we've gotten so tipsy-turvy here. But the writer is saying, God is going to judge that. That's why, that's why John said, if we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness. So by the way, in any one of these sins that we look at tonight, this is not, I don't want to say this too soon, because I really want to lay the groundwork. It's, it's so imperative. I get the idea when I talk to people that never have a clear testimony of salvation and seem to take their sin very lightly, and seem to have no heart at all. Uh, in fact, what we're going to talk about in John, a fellowship, when somebody says that they are walking in light, and they're living in sin, and they, there's no conviction of sin, there's no hunger or thirst after righteousness, there's no desire to go to church, there's no desire for the Word, I cannot help. I, first of all, I pray for everyone that has not given a clear testimony. And there are multitudes of people that have not given clear testimony. And I want so much. I wish I could go back to all the professors that used to be part of our church and they're now living happily in the world. I wish I could go back and just go back to the law and say, have you ever dealt with this? Fornicators are not going to heaven. I know. Immediately you're saying, oh, but wait a minute, if you get saved, I realize that. In fact, that's 
Paul is going to say in a few minutes, and such were some of you. But it is important that we park first at the different sins and that you and I have addressed it in our life. That we've recognized that we are sinners. So much so that we deserve God's judgment. That we repent of our sins and then we get saved. Then we fall into that category of being washed and justified and we praise God. But if there's not been that repentance... So fornicators, if you've committed immorality outside of marriage, by the way, James says this in James chapter 2, verse 10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So when you look at this category, you might go through it and say, Whew, I'm good on that, Whew, good on that, good on that. And there might be only one thing in here that you have violated. It is enough. You've commit whosoever keeps the whole law and yet offends in one point, is guilty of all. Fornicators will not enter the kingdom of heaven, nor idolaters. Idolaters will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And by the way, idolatry, clearly addressed in the Ten Commandments, uh, is pretty broad. You and I might not bow down and worship graven images, which is what we think of. That's what's so strongly condemned in the Old Testament with the people of Israel because of all the pagan false, the idol worships, idol worshiping people that they were surrounded by. But the thing that gets me, this is kind of like what Jesus was doing in Matthew chapter 5, or Matthew 5. You know, you've heard it said, thou shalt not do this, but I say this. Paul does that in, in Colossians chapter 3. And he talks about putting off the old man. And he, and he throws in covetousness. And he says, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So when you look at that, idolatry, in light of that verse in Colossians 3, idolatry is when we put anything between us and the Lord. When things mean more to us than God does. Wow. I confess. I'm an idolater. God has shown me clearly there are things at times where... It has come before the Lord. And I th- America is very guilty of that because we, we live in the land of plenty. We don't even realize how important things are to us until you consider how it fares in relationship to your relationship with God. I wonder how many people aren't here tonight because they've got other interests. That's why I can never bring myself to cancel a church service for any sporting event. Even if it's the Flyers, Stanley Cup Final Championship, last game, Game 7, and it starts right at 6 o'clock on Sunday night. By the way, and now I know this happened, uh, the quarantine during, I think, the Super Bowl season. But I'm going to tell you right now, take note. If all of a sudden... The Flyers, and I might come back to, you know, this might come back to one. If the Philadelphia Flyers are in the Stanley Cup Finals, and don't worry about that this year, it's not going to happen. But if it were to happen, and, and the last day, the final game of the Stanley Cup went to seven games, and it was on a Sunday night at 6 o'clock, and all of a sudden, Pastor gets sick. You better take a bus and come over to my house and get me out of my sin, really. I mean, just... Clearly, covetousness, which is idolatry. Anything that comes between us and the Lord. And oh, it is our heart is so easily drawn away from the Lord. Just as the hymn says, prone to wander, Lord I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Next word, adulterers. This goes back to Hebrews 13 and verse 4. Whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Adulterers, that's the person that is married, that commits physical intimacy outside the marriage covenant. These are serious things, folks. That's why God, the Bible again says, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. You and I need to make it sacred. Now, by the way, folks, in all these sins, I understand that we are flesh. No man is perfect. No woman is perfect. You and I will battle temptations. 
And these temptations will be different for each of us. You know, I am a a heterosexual guy and I cannot comprehend, I cannot relate when, when a man struggles with homosexual lust. But I've come to understand just because I don't have that battle doesn't make my heterosexual lust better than his or her homosexual lust. It's all lusts. But So we're not saying, hey, if you've ever been tempted in this, you're not going to heaven. No. But if you're living continually in, one of the, in this kind of immorality, then you're lying and you're, not walking, you're walking in darkness. By the way, there are some things, especially in the area of marriage, the marriage covenant that a violation, one violation, adultery. When a man that is in the ministry has an affair with, with someone that's not his wife, he is disqualified from the ministry. I'm not saying he can't ever be forgiven. Uh, if he's a missionary, God bless him. God can still use people like that. But folks, the, the ministry, the office of the pastor, the office of a deacon is so very important. It's not about us. And I vouch to you, if I ever violated that, I'd immediately step down from ministry. And that is the same standard that we hold to our missionaries. I'm not saying I hate a missionary or, or something's wrong when they, when they commit adultery and it's happened. My prayer is that they will repent and get back with the Lord and they're welcome to go back into fellowship when it's been addressed, but they're not able to be a pastor or a missionary again as far as in, the, in a local church being a, a pastor. And many missionaries are church planners that start churches and are pastors of churches. Next one, effeminate. And we're just going to take our time tonight go through these because this really paints verse 6 of 1 John chapter 1. Effeminates. Effeminate people will not inherit the kingdom of God. And uh, by the way, this is an interesting term. And there's actually some debate about the Greek term. There's some, the idea literally means light and dainty. Uh, and, and we use the word effeminate. Uh, some, like Strong's Concordance, and some, some resources say that it's referring to a group of people called Katamites, which was the temple, uh, it was part of the temple prostitution system in the corrupt Corinth and other Greek cities um, and Roman cities where um, men would have relationships with young boys and the boys were called Katamites and that whole immorality. But it could, it, it, it clearly is a reference to sexual immorality of a very perverted, gross kind that would not simply fall under the category of you know, premarital relations or adultery. Um, and again, there's, it could be a reference to, you know, a pet, pedophilia could fall under there. And then this next word is a long phrase that actually comes from one compound Greek word nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Now, there was never any doubt. You, historically, this is referring to homosexuality or what is called sodomy. And it's spelled out that way. And uh, only recently, there's uh, three theologians uh, which led another group of people. There's a, there's a big debate. There are people that are now trying to parse words and, and in fact, there's some that have done dissertations supporting this and then some that have refuted it. It's, it's good reading because if one, one guy I read that got his doctor's degree, his dissertation, his whole dissertation was dealing with this one word. Fascinating stuff. And when you read what the church fathers say about it and, and then, of course, all the modern, it's amazing how much this has been scrutinized. But any translation that uses the word homosexuality abuses of themselves with mankind it is clearly referring to homosexuality not my words don't shoot the messenger you know in this day and age boy is that politically incorrect boy is that scripturally correct 
abusers of themselves with mankind, homosexuals, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, if you, we have, praise the Lord, we've had many homosexuals that have repented of their sins and been part of our fellowship. And we welcome that. What a blessing. We minister to people like that. We've, we've ministered to people from all kinds of, um, just like this, people that have backgrounds, all kinds of, of corruptions that have repented. And, and, and again, their temptations would be different than ours. But they're not living in sin. And so it would apply when Paul said, such were some of you. Verse 10, nor thieves. Now, remember that thing about the, keeping the whole law and yet it found in one point? You might, it's kind of like what Paul did in Romans chapter 2. He gets, lists all these things. Maybe it's at the end of Romans chapter 1. I forget, it's been a while. But he lists all these things. And he includes like the really bad with the, oh, that's not too bad. And then he, and then he, and then he, um, he basically is setting everyone up to, to show them because he gives this list and he's kind of expecting the people to, to wag their fingers. And then he says, and then he turns it on, your, on them. He says, do you say that a man should, should not commit adultery? Do you commit adultery? And then he goes on, he does that. And we could do that with this. You could look at these and say, I've never committed adultery. I've never, I've never been a homosexual I'm not, you know, I'm woe on these people. And then thieves. Thieves. Say, I'm not a thief. Have you ever stolen anything? Be honest. No. Not even that paper clip from work? Come on now. It's amazing how easy it is for us to justify how the company's stuff we deserve it and we we give ourselves little tips right people do this all the time well you know i work for the company and they don't pay me enough and then they they steal this you ask mr kerr ask portia what they think you know you try to run a business and all these people walking away with things that don't belong to them how many things do you have to take to be a thief just one I've told with you, and for those of you that haven't heard it, I'll share my life of crime. Began when I was a little boy, and we went to the Farmer in the Dell. You remember the Farmer in the Dell restaurant? Forget where it was. I think this was the one it was. It had a, a, a gift store, and it had one of those old little toy cannons. And it was right on the shelf where it was my level. This is, my, this is where my life of crime began. I think it ended here, too. I looked, I remember looking both ways. Because I wanted it. I think I asked my parents, Mom, can you get me this? No, no, Stevie, we don't have money for it. And I remember it. it I got so desperate. I had to do what I had to do. That was my mind. So I looked to the left and looked to the right. Nobody was looking. And I took it and put it in my pocket. And as a little boy, boy, did I feel guilty after that. Couldn't really enjoy that. And then, sadly, after I got saved, Farmer in the Dell closed Never had a chance to get it right. But I've held that cannon in my pocket. No, I actually have it. <laughs> but that's enough. One sin, whosoever shall keep the whole law. A thief. Thieves shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Are you getting an idea how bad your sin is? Let it be. Stand there. Tremble at the law. Humble yourself and fall at the foot of the cross. Because you and I are worthy of judgment, just like the next person. Nor thieves, nor covetous. Oh, who has not committed, who's not violated the tenth commandment? Thou shalt not covet. And then it gives a list of things. Coveters shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Drunkards shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Revilers. Oh my. I think James says the tongue is the hardest thing to contain. Possibly out of this whole list. I have met godly people that in every other way served the Lord, were faithful in church, never missed a church service. Some were involved in music ministry and all that. And yet the one thing they couldn't control was their tongue. And by the way, in a church setting, as a pastor, those are the hardest people to deal with because the tongue is so... I hate it. 
Of course, I don't hate it enough to cut my own tongue out. and My tongue violates as much as the next person's. Uh, but I hate it. Revilers. Gossip. Slanders. People that go around trashing other people. If that was the only thing they ever did, and they never lusted outside of marriage, and they never stole anything, if that was the only thing they did, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It's enough to condemn them. Nor extortioners. Extortion is taking something that belongs to others through trickery, through avarice. Extortioners shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You know, there's a lot of people get jobs as telemarketers. And uh, there are some companies, folks, that are just downright terrorists. In debt collectors. My daughter's told me about, there's a guy, I, I have it as an illustration file, but I didn't print it out. Um, and I think several people do this, but there's some YouTubers, one guy in particular that I saw, who is a tech genius. And he will, he'll wait until people call him telemarketers that are just trying to get information. And, uh, you know, in fact, there's so many um, identity theft. And this one guy that I saw was able to, He's able to get the people talking. One guy, he, took, he kept on the phone for five hours, which is great because that's five hours. This guy isn't calling and stealing money from older people. But he was able to somehow hack into the guy's system and just totally gave him, like, uh, gave him fake credit card numbers and then was able to log in and somehow pretend that the guy, so that his, he, he would think that he was actually stealing money from this guy and he wasn't. And, and he would play with them in ways that would get the person so frustrated. And I loved it because these are the crooks. And by the way, this is a whole new... There are thousands of people that are now doing online extortion. The Bible says extortioners shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But how does this end as we close this text here? It says, but... And I love this part. But such were some of you. Such were some of you. But, remember that's a contrast. You are washed. Washed in the blood. So everyone, anyone that falls under this category, if that's your past, folks, Romans chapter 8 says there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. If you've repented of that, you've called it sin, you're not justifying it, you're not saying, oh, no, no, that's not sin, I'm doing right. If you've repented of it, it's not saying that you don't still, uh, and many people will still struggle with different things that were part of their past, but they're not living that lifestyle. And that's the idea of what, Paul, what John is saying. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Our challenge, folks, today, we are living in a day where people are walking in darkness and they're, they're saying, I'm not doing anything wrong. Right and wrong has, what did I say, Isaiah 5.20 says, well, one of them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. I received an email from Sam Rohrer. Some of you may have heard of Sam Rohrer. He was a politician and... Um, might still be a politician, sent an email out during the, the coronavirus. It was, it was on October 1st of last year. And this was when things were really going hot and heavy with the coronavirus and the, the quarantine. And he said this, just a simple paragraph that was so profound. He said, it is evident that morality is rapidly deteriorating in America today. Riots in Portland have gone on for more than 100 days while pastors are held in contempt of court. Casino, casinos are permitted to open while churches remain shackled by government orders. Vandalism is considered by the media to be a peaceful protest while worship is labeled reckless. Abortion clinics are deemed essential while church activities are canceled. That is our America. And we are in the process. We are living in that. And if things, 
if what's happened in England and what's happening in Canada happens here, uh, the church will beware because we are quickly being marginalized and that which, just a message like today. In fact, this message, which right now, I believe, is being streamed on Facebook. And until the Facebook higher-ups, until Mr. Zuckerberg comes across it, and many, many Bible-believing churches are waiting for this, who's streaming their services and having them online. It's already happened on YouTube where they will be shutting us down. That's why I'm grateful. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, I wish we had more people here. I wish we had, we only had 22 people. Now, I know more people will watch this throughout the week, the morning service. But we had our lowest online service this morning, and I'm trying to realize, you know what, that's, that's, that's nothing. What matters is, is who's here and who's faithful but the fact that every message for the last year is now online and available has never, in my life, in my three decades of ministry, I've never been able to do that. Every time I close a book on a message, it's done. And the only people that heard are the people inside these walls. It'll never be repeated again. Well, we did put it on cassette tape back in the day. Now it's online. And it's on various venues. And you know what? I'm really expecting a message like this and maybe all of our messages and all Bible-believing churches. It would not surprise me down the road if Facebook shuts us all down. So much for free speech. If YouTube shuts us all down. In fact, I'm kind of counting. Uh, it'll first be Facebook or YouTube and then the next. Praise the Lord for sermon audio. Really. Because that's... You know, but they're going to invade the studios of Sermon Audio. and uh, In fact, they're, I, I heard recently that they're planning a bunker and a place where they can you know, keep these all the, the hundreds of thousands of sermons that are on Sermon Audio that are preaching the gospel. They're going to put them in a lockdown and all. But you know what? I could just see the government going in and destroying that too. But you know what? Praise God, even if it's just there for one year, that people will be able to hear the gospel. What a blessing pray folks because america needs revival and now we have an opportunity where people that really want to get serious about god if they they're not comfortable going to church they got a hundred thousand the thousands of churches they can find online and hear those sermons and god can deal with them in ways that they only would deal with people in the four walls so pray pray for revival and if you have not come to the light if you've not truly repented of your sins, allow the law to condemn you. Allow the Word of God. Again, we'll close with 1 John chapter, chapter 1 and verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, if you're justifying some of the sins that we talked about, you're saying, I'm not doing wrong. We lie and do not the truth. May God open our eyes to our own deception. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. Help us. We live in a world that is dark, and we sometime were darkness. And I pray, Father, that You would open our eyes to the glorious light of the Gospel, that You would convict religious people, that You would convict professors, but not possessors of Christianity, and that You would bring us into the light not that we would be perfect, Father. We're so grateful that the blood of Christ cleanses us from sin, but that we might walk in the light and that that light might demonstrate that our deeds are manifest in You. Not perfection, Father, but honesty and humility. And we ask Your blessing in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's take our Bibles. No, you took your Bibles. Let's take our hymn books. Let's stand and we'll close in song. All right, let's turn to him 334. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Him 334. When you get there, please stand. There is a song in my heart today, something I never had. Jesus has taken my sin away. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Oh, say, but I'm glad, I'm glad. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Jesus has come and my cup's overrun. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Wonderful, marvelous love he brings into Tunnels the sun.
Jesus has come and my cup's overrun. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Won't you come to him with all your care, weary and worn and sad? You too will sing as his love you share. Cups overrun. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Amen. You're dismissed.